Good afternoon and welcome to today's OR Today webinar, The Eyes Have It, Ophthalmic Instrument Reprocessing and Understanding Short Cycles. Today we are joined by Angela Ritchie, Clinical Education Specialist at Steris. Angela has been working in sterile processing for more than 15 years as a tech, lead, and associate manager, playing an active role in opening an off-site reprocessing center, and most recently was market manager of sterile processing for eight hospitals in Nebraska and Western Iowa. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Steris. Steris helps alleviate patient care in the perioperative environments of OR, SPD, and GI endoscopy. Comprehensive solutions and products from equipment to consumables through Steris help solve the biggest challenges while also supporting their customers' future growth in the advancement of patient care every day. Please note, Key Surgical, recently acquired by Steris, is now a product line of consumables within Steris. For more information on the solutions presented in this webinar, please visit keysurgical.com. Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour from the California Board of Registered Nurses. You can obtain your certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's presentation. You must complete the survey to receive your CE certificate. You will be able to download your certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. Today's webinar has also been approved for credits from HSPA, CBSPD, BASC and CBRN. To receive these credits, please follow the instructions in the post-webinar survey email. If you have any questions, you can reach our team at webinar at mdpublishing.com. All right, let's have some fun and kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our OR Today lunch bags. The attendee that can tell us the answer to this trivia question will be our winner. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. What color ribbon has become the universal symbol of colon cancer? Answer now using the question feature on your webinar dashboard, and I'll reveal the answer and winner at the end of today's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter is Angela Ritchie. Angela, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Jamie, and welcome everyone. Today we're talking the eyes have it, ophthalmic instrument reprocessing and understanding short cycles. Successful completion of this program requires uh, that you are here for the entire thing. There is no partial credit. I am an employee of Steris, as Jamie mentioned, and all fees are underwritten by education funding provided by Steris. Any commercial products seen or referred to during this presentation do not constitute a commercial support by me or by Steris. As Jamie mentioned, our program today is credentialed for one AEU and one IPCH by BASC and one contact hour of continuing education credit by CBRN, CBSPD, and HSPA. Through our partnership with CCI, it also meets CNOR and CSSM recertification requirements for perioperative nurses. And now that we've made our way through most of the alphabet, let's check out our learning objectives. We have three. The first is to list three processing differences between eye and other surgical instruments. Second, identify when short cycle steam sterilization is appropriate. And third, to create a plan to avoid common pitfalls of eye instrument processing. Shakespeare said it best, eyes are the window to the soul. They speak joy, sorrow, confusion, and anger without a sound. We depend on them to tell us about the world around us, and eye surgery can be scary. The patient's thoughts can go to whether or not their eyes will still be able to tell a story when the surgery is over. For many, their eyes stop speaking. Toxic anterior segment syndrome, resulting from contaminated eye instruments, can bring about blindness instead of restoring, restoring sight. Multiple investigations, scrutinized procedures, evaluated policies, and inclusion of developed recommended practices 
all help to eliminate the possibility of tasks. These practices require a change to reprocessing methods that you use today, some of which may take longer than before, but it doesn't mean you have to slow down your eye instrument processing. It does mean that you'll have to manage the impact these changes bring. TAS is commonly thought of as an infection, but it's not. Let's examine what causes it. Many of us have experienced something in our eyes, the scratchiness of dirt, the burn of shower soap, or the itchy eyes from pet dander. These irritations happen when foreign materials reach the eye's surface. TAS is a severe form of irritation that happens when foreign material enters the inner layers of the anterior segment of the eye. The anterior segment of the eye includes the cornea, iris, ciliary body, and lens. These are the areas exposed during eye surgery. When foreign material enters and stays here, the sensitive components of the eye are irritated and may be damaged. TAS is a rapid acute reaction to foreign material. A fleck of sterile powder from a surgeon's glove, remnants of bio burden from a previous surgery, or residual cleaning chemistries that were not, not rinsed properly can all lead to TAS. The material causes irritation that if not treated immediately leads to further irritation, the formation of cataracts, and even blindness. Many associate TAS with cataract surgeries, but it can happen during any eye surgery. So where does that foreign material come from? It comes from the surgical instrumentation and materials used during the surgery. TAS has been associated with enzymes used to prepare and clean the instrumentation for reuse. Enzymes break down protein, the very substance that the eye is made of. TAS has been caused by mineral deposits left on instruments from the water and steam used to prepare them for the procedure. Toxins, in particular endotoxins, found on instrumentation have been transferred during procedures causing TAS as well. One last source were the gloves worn by surgeons and nurses. Powder used inside the gloves was transferred during surgery, resulting in TAS. All of these are preventable. Three are due to reprocessing. The American Academy of Ophthalmology, Ophthalmology published a great article on the etiology of TAS. It also discusses sources, many of the known sources of contaminants that have resulted in TAS. The Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, or AMI, dedicated an annex, M, to TAS within the Comprehensive Guide to Steam Sterilization and Sterility Assurance in Healthcare Facilities in their standard ANSI AMI ST79 in 2017. Instruments used in eye surgery have special needs. The Ophthalmic Instrument Cleaning and Sterilization Task Force listed three aspects that make this so. The first, ophthalmic procedures are faster and produce less soil than other surgical procedures. Second, eye surgeries such as cataract surgery are performed at greater volumes. And third, minute amounts of detergent or chemical contaminants have severe effects on eye tissue. These three concerns, in combination with TAS, drives change to the reprocessing of eye instruments. Eye instruments follow the same reprocessing path of other surgical instruments. During the procedure, gross soil is removed using sterile water. After the procedure, point of use treatment keeps instrument moist, preventing residual soils from drying on the instruments. Manual cleaning follows. Instruments are soaked, cleaned and rinsed. Often an ultrasonic cleaning step is required by the instrument manufacturers. These cleaning machines use sound waves to create imploding bubbles that pull soils off the instrument surfaces. Thorough rinsing follows. At some facilities, washer disinfectors are used to clean, rinse, and disinfect eye instruments. Even though the process cleans and rinses, some instrument manufacturers may still require some manual cleaning steps and ultrasonication prior to placement in the washer disinfector. After cleaning and rinsing, the dry devices are inspected for function, damage, and residual soils. Those that pass inspection are assembled into sets where they are packaged and then sterilized for the next patient. 
in the past, the focus of reprocessing was to remove and inactivate infectious agents that could cause infection. With the rise of TAS, eye instruments have a second goal, the removal of materials that could cause TAS. Let's look at the ways that TAS has impacted the processing of eye instruments. The recommendations from the TAS Task Force were issued in 2012, and it has taken some time to implement across the industry. Many instructions for use or IFUs have been changed, some of which are retrospective. It's important to obtain and review all eye instrument IFUs. How many different brands of instrumentation are in your ophthalmic sets? Processing differences can be found between instrument types, models, and manufacturers. Be sure to obtain an IFU for each type, model, and manufacturer of instrumentation. Are your IFUs current? Review your IFUs and reach out to manufacturers to ensure that you have the most current version. And finally, be sure to regularly review the IFUs. The frequency will vary between facilities. It may be annually, biannually, or at a different frequency established per facility policy. Whether a dedicated one-room eye reprocessing de decontamination station or a multi-room decontamination department, all the elements contained in ANSI Amy ST79 Comprehensive Guide to Steam Sterilization and Sterility Assurance should be in place. Processing should flow linearly from dirty to clean. This should include a physical separation between dirty activities such as sonication and clean activities like assembly and sterilization. Task appropriate personal protective equipment, as defined by OSHA, shall be used. The first steps of the processing loop are the same as other instruments. The true impact of the processing loop begins with sonic cleaning, follows an automated cleaning, and ends with sterilization. Let's review the process, paying special attention to the things that are different. Point of use treatment should occur immediately after the procedure. Prior to point of use treatment, be sure to remove and dispose of single use items. Instruments, lumens should be flushed. The use of pretreatment products to maintain moisture is dependent upon the instrument eye of use. In some cases, only sterile water may be used for pretreatment. In others, a pretreatment product may be used. Additionally, phacoemulsification and irrigation aspiration handpieces can be placed within a bath of sterile water to avoid drying of debris and viscoelastic agents, especially the drying of the ophthalmic viscosurgical device, or OVD. Always check with the IFU before implementing any policy. Always following the IFUs for the instrument and also the cleaning chemistries. We want to measure the water and the cleaning chemistry to be dispensed. Do not approximate the dose of chemistry and water volumes. Manual cleaning relies on the right cleaning chemistry solution and the physical removal of soils with lint-free cloths and brushes. While cleaning, watch for tiny lumens, box locks, and other areas where complex joints may hold debris. The IFU will typically list the size and type of brush that are needed to successfully clean these challenging areas of the device. Disposable and reusable brushes are readily available. Consider using single-use brushes. Reuse of brushes can lead to cross-contamination, a buildup of bio-burden, and potential biofilm formation. If brushes are reused, they should be cleaned and either disinfected or sterilized daily. Most importantly, critical water should be used for the final rinse. Critical water removes impurities, such as endotoxins, metals, and other contaminants found in tap water that may lead to TAS. Critical water includes sterile, distilled, deionized, and reverse osmosis water. And for more information on critical water, ANSI Amy ST108 was published in August or September of 2023 and is available. In reviewing, most IFUs shows the ultrasonic cycles as mandatory, not optional. Ultrasonic cleaning works through the creation and implosion of bubbles near the surface of instruments. The imploding bubbles create a small vacuum, which pulls soils from the instrument surface. The cleaning solution acts to loosen and suspend soils, preventing redeposition. The power behind the bubble is dependent on the frequency of the sonic wave. The cycle's length, 
cleaning chemistry, and sonic wave frequency are questions to ask when developing policies and procedures for reprocessing ophthalmic instrumentation. There is no one size fits all. The sonics should be designed for surgical instruments. Sonics used to clean jewelry or car parts operate at different frequencies that could prevent cleaning or damage instruments. In addition to separation based on metal type, eye instruments should be segregated from other instruments. Inclusion of other surgical instruments provides an increased chance of contamination with procedure-specific soils not associated with eye surgery that could be difficult to remove from eye instruments. When using a sonic cleaner for both eye and general surgical instruments, the sonic should be drained, cleaned, and rinsed before placing eye instruments into the sonic. Some instructions for use may have you seeing double. One manufacturer now recommends not one ultrasonic cycle, but two. The first ultrasonic unit is for static soaking and ultrasonic cleaning, the second unit for a critical water rinsing cycle. And don't forget to remove silicone mats before placing the instruments into the ultrasonic as they can decrease the effectiveness of the ultrasonic cleaning. When reviewing an IFU for ophthalmic instruments, you may find a welcome site in the choice afforded in the decontamination process. Most often you will find instructions for manual and mechanical cleaning. Mechanical cleaning typically involves a washer disinfector. Washer disinfectors are great when high volumes of instrumentation are to be cleaned and rinsed. Units automatically dispense cleaning chemistry at the desired concentration for good cleaning. They also include a critical water final rinse. The mechanical cleaning process provides thermal disinfection at the end of the cycle. The final rinse water is heated to a minimum temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit for at least one minute. The heated water circulates within the washer while maintaining the temperature for that defined period of time to kill microorganisms. Thermal disinfection is the critical part of the process that renders the instrumentation safe for handling on the clean side for inspection. It's critical to follow the instrument's IFU, the washer's IFU, and use adapters for lumens as directed. Many sterile processing professionals have been cautioned against mechanical cleaning due to the small lumens and intricate and delicate nature of the instruments employed in ophthalmic procedures. Keep in mind that if the IFU includes direction for mechanical cleaning, it means the manufacturer has validated that process. Specific cycle parameters may be needed, which include use of neutral cleaning chemistries, less physical force or impingement from the water sprays, and an ability to flow the small lumens. IFU review is not something to take lightly. The IFU may include very specific information regarding cleaning chemistries, starting with the agents used at point of use. It is not uncommon to find direction to use enzyme-free agents. Read the ingredient list carefully and select point of use treatments that comply with this portion of the directive. While the use of a surgical towel wet with sterile water is an option in the AME standards, the potential for lint to remain on the instruments or within the set itself is a real concern and why commercial emollients that remain moist for extended periods are so popular in facilities that perform ophthalmic procedures. Many instrument manufacturers no longer recommend enzymatic solutions for ophthalmic instruments, instead requiring a low foaming neutral pH detergent. However, be aware a few ophthalmic IFUs state to wash with water only, rinse with critical water only, and then sterilize. If the only option for cleaning is manual cleaning, disinfection may not be possible before the instruments are passed to the clean side. A bird's eye review of disinfectant labels may reveal many disinfectants contain quats or quaternary, quaternary ammonia compounds. While quats are an ideal disinfectant, many instrument IFUs specifically caution against the use of quats as they leave residues if not rinsed appropriately, and some are not designed to be rinsed at all. Instead, they are designed to maintain moisture for a specific dwell time. While fine for surfaces, this would leave a residue on ophthalmic instruments and is a primary example of why many IFUs specifically state not to use quats.
some people might say, don't worry about disinfection, they're going through sterilization next. However, disinfection protects staff members. The eye can house persistent infections. In other words, infectious materials such as viruses that have been eliminated from the rest of the body can still reside in the eye. Examples are the herpes virus, adenovirus, and SARS-CoV-2. Cleaning removes soils, but is not intended to remove all microorganisms. Disinfection reduces the level of microorganisms on eye instruments to a safe level to handle with bare hands. Thermal disinfection requires instruments to reach 180 degrees Fahrenheit for a specified amount of time. Some ultrasonic cleaners and all washer disinfectors have specified cycles that clean, rinse, and thermally disinfect instrumentation. Thermal disinfection uses heated critical water to obtain and maintain, maintain that desired temperature. The treated water contains no harmful chemicals that could hurt the delicate eye tissues. Steam sterilization is the most common sterilization method used for ophthalmic instruments. It uses steam under pressure to create temperatures of 250 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Devices exposed to steam are quickly heated to the same temperature, killing the microorganisms. After cleaning, rinsing, and disinfection, instruments are inspected, tested, and packaged for sterilization. Instruments are inspected for residual soil or moisture that could interfere with sterilization. Any nicks, scratches, pits, rust, and other physical damage could harbor microorganisms protecting them from the sterilization process. Additionally, damage like bends can prevent instruments from working as intended. Always inspect with lighted magnification. A small amount of residual or damage can have great consequences. Cutting and articulating tools must be tested for function. Specialized test sheets confirm sharp edges. Articulation should require little pressure and be smooth. Insulation of electrical tools must also be tested. Poor or failing insulation can lead to current arcs that damage delicate tissues. You should have policies and procedures that manage repair and refurbishment of instrumentation. A lot goes into packaging an instrument for sterilization. We're not going to go into that much detail here. Some things that are common errors that we see include containment devices that are not validated for the sterilization cycle. Whether a pouch, wrap, or container, it must be validated for that sterilization cycle for which it will be used. All instrument joints or closures must be in an open position. This allows steam to reach all points of the instrument. Lastly, be sure to evenly distribute the instrument weight within the tray and within the sterilizer. High metal mass areas will collect more condensate, making it difficult to dry at the end of the cycle. Traditionally, there have been two types of steam sterilization processes, terminal sterilization and immediate use steam sterilization. Amy defines a terminal sterilization cycle as, quote, a process by which the product is sterilized within a sterile barrier system that permits storage for use at a later time, end quote. Terminal sterilization can sterilize large loads of diverse medical instrumentation. Some sterilizers can sterilize 300 pounds or more of instruments. The validated cycle achieves a sterility assurance level, or SAL, of 10 to the minus 6. In other words, it is designed to kill 1 trillion microorganisms per instrument. The instruments are packaged for storage and should be dry at the end of the sterilization cycle. The validated dry time is based upon the worst case conditions, in this case, the maximum weight and the hardest to dry instruments. Immediate use steam sterilization, or IUSS, is used when an emergency dictates that an instrument is needed right away. Amy defines IUSS as sterilization method that involves the shortest possible time between a sterilized item's removal from the sterilizer and its aseptic transfer to the sterile field. A sterilized item intended for immediate use is not stored for future use nor held from one case to another. IUSS is intended for small loads, typically a single instrument. They achieve a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus six, just like a terminal sterilization process, but may use an abbreviated exposure time. However, not all IUSS cycles do. All IUSS cycles do use an abbreviated dry time. In fact, it's typical for no dry time or one minute to be used. 
As a result, the instruments are wet and cannot be stored for later use. A third type of steam sterilization process has come to light. This process was developed in response to the unique sterilization needs of eye centers. Though the short cycle was developed with eye centers in mind, it shares the same characteristics of those processes as defined in ANSI Amy ST79. Short cycles are only for ophthalmic instruments. Ophthalmic instruments and instrument sets are very lightweight, whereas an orthopedic tray may weigh in upwards of 30 pounds. The ophthalmic tray must be less than or may be less than five pounds. The sterilizer is intended to produce large loads of ophthalmic instruments. As is true for all steam sterilization, it must provide an SAL of 10 to the minus six. Though the short cycle uses abbreviated dry times, the devices and tray must still be dry at the end. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services say short cycle sterilization is a form of terminal sterilization that is acceptable for routine use for a wrapped or contained load where pre-cleaning of instruments is performed according to the manufacturer's instructions and the load meets the device manufacturer's instructions for use, includes a complete dry time, and is packaged in a wrap or rigid sterilization container validated for later use. Most people that want to follow the CMS guidelines for short cycles do not believe that the short cycle can be shorter. How can these cycles be shorter than the typical terminal sterilization cycle? The complete dry time must be used. The secret is shorter validated dry times. Dry times and sterilizers ensure that the set is dry and can be stored without fear of microbial infiltration through residual moisture. The time required to dry a set depends on the weight of instrumentation, the materials of construction, the containment device used, and the configuration of the load. Sterilizer manufacturers validate the, time, the dry time programmed on the sterilizer based on the heaviest set weights, toughest materials to heat, set configurations that encourage condensate, and mixed load configurations that represent the worst case materials to dry. Ophthalmic instrument sets are lightweight and mostly metallic. In steam sterilization, they are quick to heat, create less condensate, and dry quickly. A load of ophthalmic instruments takes much less time to dry than a load of heavy complex orthopedic instruments, yet the sterilizer is programmed for those tougher to dry loads. Often, the ophthalmic instrument's dry time listed in the manufacturer's written IFU is less than, dry time, than the dry time programmed on the sterilizer. In fact, this is the only part of the sterilization cycle that can be safely changed by the healthcare practitioner to be shorter. It does, however, require work by the user to ensure that it's done correctly. Steam sterilization has three main phases, preconditioning, exposure, and drying. Preconditioning removes air and allows steam to penetrate the packages and instrumentation. It heats all items to the temperature necessary for sterilization. Changing the preconditioning in any way can prevent steam from reaching the instruments. Without steam, sterilization cannot happen. Microbes can survive the process and spread infection to the next patient the instrument is used on. The exposure phase maintains a specified temperature for a specific amount of time to kill the microorganisms on the instrumentation. Shortening the exposure time allows microorganisms to survive that sterilization process. The surviving microorganisms can be passed on to the patient, causing infection. Drying removes moisture and condensate, drying the instruments and packaging. When drying is shortened, condensate can remain pooled in the packaging and packaging may be wet. The water provides a path for microbes to swim in and reach the sterile instruments inside. The contaminated instruments can pass the microorganisms onto the patient, causing infection. The time required for microorganisms to reach the instrument is dependent upon several factors. The total environmental microbial load, the type of microorganism, the amount of residual moisture, even the way the items are handled, can speed up or slow down microbial penetration. Proving the ability to sterilize requires materials and skill sets not typically available to ophthalmic clinics. Attempting to validate a new exposure time or preconditioning parameters is not something an eye clinic should take on. Drying, on the other hand, is something that an ophthalmic clinic can do. It only requires time, a good test protocol, and a scale. 
The Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation identifies the necessary validation testing for steam sterilizers in the standard ANSI-AMI ST8 hospital sterilizers. Within the required testing is a section devoted to dry times. This document lists the acceptance criteria. Section 5.7 lists various configurations and the acceptance criteria of each. Though it includes wrapped trays and textiles, it specifically avoids the testing of rigid sterilization containers. Instead, readers are directed to ANSI AMI ST77 for containment devices for reusable medical device sterilization. This document defines the performance characteristics of rigid sterilization container systems. Both documents require a worst case load for testing and three consecutive test cycles. At the end of each cycle, following the cooling of the items, packs are examined for residual moisture. Packs wrapped with or containing absorptive materials must also be below the maximum allowable weight. The weight gain is from condensate that is absorbed by the material. Minimizing the change in weight demonstrates minimal condensate retention. In other words, it shows that it's dry enough. The standards require a test protocol and report. The protocol describes the worst case load, the materials that will be used, the sterilizer cycle parameters, the number of test cycles, and the requirements to pass the test. The complete details are listed in the standard. The test report documents the test results, collects pertinent records like cycle printouts, and records the results of the test. Two things specific to the facility and must are specific to the facility and must be defined by the facility. The worst case load is the load and sterilizer conditions at the facility that would create the greatest challenge to dry. Unlike the sterilizer's worst case load that looks at all instrumentation in healthcare, the facility's worst case load is based on the instrumentation and containment devices at the facility. Consider using the heaviest sets and sets with a large number of silicone, plastics, and other difficult to heat materials. These require the most steam to heat up, making the most condensate. It should also be a full load. Full loads will make more condensate than smaller loads. Sterilization cycle parameters are defined by the instrument, the containment device, and the sterilizer's written instructions for use. Typically, preconditioning cannot be changed by the facility. It's important to note what type of conditioning, whether pre-vacuum or gravity, and the sterilizer model when describing preconditioning parameters. Exposure time is typically set at a minimum time depending on the sterilizer manufacturer's validations. However, some instruments or containers may require a longer exposure time, so always check those IFUs. Sterilizers are programmed with a minimum dry time based upon their validations. However, this is one of the sterilizer settings that can be changed to longer or shorter. Start by reviewing the instrument IFU. It typically has the shortest dry time. It may be possible to use a dry time that is shorter than the dry time in the IFU. Run trial test cycles using shorter dry times. Once the shorter dry time is selected, write the protocol and perform the test with it. The short cycle is only acceptable for ophthalmic instruments and instrument sets. Mixed loads containing other types of instrumentation would not be acceptable in the short cycle. The short cycle is a terminal cycle and may be used at any time. So how do we avo avoid the pitfalls of eye instrument reprocessing? The first pitfall is not following the IFU for decontamination and cleaning. Continuing to reprocess the same as we always have cleaned is not a prudent process. In healthcare facilities with mixed specialties, separating ophthalmic instruments can be challenging, including critical steps such as identification of ophthalmic instrumentation and verification of bath cleaning prior to sonication with incompetencies can help. Consider adding a dedicated ophthalmic ultrasonic cleaner when processing volume or term time warrant it. Be sure to review the frequency for changing the chemistry solution and rinse water. Some instruments may require fresh solutions each time. Remember, some IFUs require critical water as your final rinse, eliminating the possibility of residual water minerals from drying on the instruments. Be sure that critical water is accessible for staff to rinse the instruments. 
some instruments may require a critical water sonication cycle. To keep processing flowing as quickly as possible, consider a second sonic cleaner dedicated to critical water sonication. You may also consider using a cleaner that has an automated cycle, including a critical water rinse. Fully automated ultrasonic cleaners free staff from draining and rinsing. This gives staff more time to perform other tasks, such as manual cleaning, helping to maintain a fast turn time. Many offer a thermal rinse, disinfecting the instrumentation and making them safe to handle. As you know, we don't all see the same. So relying on the naked eye could lead to missed soils. Invest in lighted magnification. Lighted magnification will help find residual soils hiding in box locks and on instrument teeth. Of course, even a magnified eye can't see everything. Cleaning indicators for washers and ultrasonic baths ensure equipment is functioning while cleaning verification tests look for invisible residual soil. Caution is needed when using these for ophthalmic instruments. Cleaning indicators start with a soil test. The washer or ultrasonic cleaner must be able to remove the soil. These soils are made with a variety of materials that, if transferred to an instrument, could cause problems with the patient's eye. Facilities must reach out to the manufacturers of the test to determine if additional cleaning is needed prior to use of the equipment for eye instrumentation. Caution is also needed when using cleaning verification tests. Cleaning verification testing collects samples from the instruments and tests those samples for residual soils. Some may leave chemicals on the device while others use swabs to collect samples. Swabs have the potential for releasing fibers that stay on the device. Even the smallest fiber has the potential for creating a task situation. Facilities should consider a secondary process to remove potential residuals prior to processing ophthalmic instruments. Is it really a short cycle? Not following the nationally recognized infection control guidelines, in particular those that are referred to the reprocessing of ophthalmic instruments, could result in infection and non-compliance with CMS and accreditation standards. One of the biggest misunderstandings is immediate use steam sterilization. It's important that you know the difference between short cycles and IUSS. So let's test your knowledge. Is it really a short cycle if it follows the instrument manufacturer's IFU for terminal sterilization? Yes, it is. Is it really a short cycle if it follows the instrument manufacturer's IFU for flash sterilization? No, flash is another term used to describe some immediate use steam sterilization cycles. Is it really a short cycle if facility validated dry time is used? It is. And finally, is it really a short cycle if a small amount of water is left in the pan after the dry time? That's a no. Any water left behind, regardless of the dry time that you're using, is unacceptable and must be addressed. Tabletop sterilizers are compact, convenient steam sterilizers. Most use pre-programmed sterilization cycles and have unique preconditioning phases. They also represent a challenge for facility compliance to instrument IFUs. The sterilizer's preset cycles are typically not adjustable. In other words, the only cycle that can be run on the sterilizer is limited to those preset cycles. To ensure sterility of the instrument, the instrument's IFU must list the conditions of the tabletop sterilizer. It's important to review the IFUs of instruments against those pre-programmed cycles. Discrepancies should be evaluated and resolved. Never assume that a short cycle in the sterilizer will sterilize the instruments. Also, don't assume that a longer exposure time will be okay for those instruments. Reach out to the instrument manufacturer for help resolving the sterilization cycle parameter differences. Another aspect to consider is sterilization accessories. Often tabletop sterilizers run non-standard cycles. Non-standard non -standard cycles need non-standard accessories or at least accessories that have been validated for that sterilization cycle. Remember that accessories include anything used during the sterilization process. So that includes pouches, trays, wraps, indicator tape, chemical indicator strips, and biological indicators. 
Another important aspect of tabletop sterilizers is water. The tap may look pure, but it holds minerals, dissolved gases, and microorganisms within it. It's critical that water has been treated to remove these contaminants be used to fill the reservoirs. Distilled water is recommended by most tabletop sterilizer manufacturers. Another common error that can lead to impurities and the formation of biofilms is failing to change that water. The water reservoir is often used to collect condensate from steam that is vented from the chamber at the end of the cycle. Over time, that condensate can carry impurities from the sterilizer load into the reservoir. The impurities can then build up in the reservoir, allowing the water to carry those impurities into the next sterilization load. Water reservoirs must be routinely drained and cleaned as directed by the sterilizer's IFU. Failure to drain and clean the reservoir can allow biofilms to form. A biofilm is a colony of bacteria that develops a strong protective coating. The coating protects the bacteria from disinfectants and sterilization. Pieces of mature biofilms can travel with the water into the sterilizer cha chamber, creating an opportunity for contamination. Speaking of cleaning, sterilizer chambers and racks must be routinely, routinely cleaned using appropriate cleaners. Refer to the sterilizer's IFU for the frequency and types of cleaning agents to use. Remember to thoroughly rinse chamber surfaces after cleaning. Residual chemicals can be transferred to instruments during the sterilization process. As we have learned, very small amounts of residuals can cause tasks. How many times have you watched someone approach a stop sign, slow down, and then go right through without stopping? They looked both ways and no one was coming, and they've probably been successfully doing the role without a single accident. It only takes one time, though, for a bad practice to turn catastrophic. The implementation of new cleaning instructions will increase the time spent during reprocessing of an instrument. To stop IUSS will require more time to sterilize instruments. Overall, the changes that help prevent tasks will increase the time needed to reprocess ophthalmic instrumentation. However, there are things that can be done to improve processing time. The implementation of new cleaning instructions will decrease the time spent during reprocessing of an instrument. Excuse me, increase the time spent during the reprocessing of an instrument. Discontinuing IUSS will force the use of dry times. Drying the instruments within the sterilizer will lengthen the total time to sterilize instrumentation, making the cycle longer. Overall, the changes that help prevent tasks will increase the time needed to reprocess ophthalmic instrumentation. However, there are things that can be done to improve processing time. Look at your equipment throughput. Instruments may wait on racks as instruments are manually cleaned and collected to fill a chamber, or the opposite. Instruments are ready to process, but waiting for cycles to complete. It may be necessary to purchase new equipment. Make sure that the, the equipment will support the workflow of the department. Facilities processing many types of surgical instruments may want to dedicate ultrasonic cleaners for ophthalmic instrumentation. Optimize your dry time. Start with the instrument. If the shorter dry time is still too long, consider performing a dry time protocol to shorten the time further. Delaying procedures due to instrument availability is not acceptable in any facility. However, it shouldn't be fixed through shortcuts and immediate use steam sterilization. Instead, perform timing studies and monitor procedure volumes. It may be necessary to increase instrument inventory to accommodate new processing times and procedural workloads. Ultimately, a balance must be achieved between instrument inventory and reprocessing speed. We discussed several changes that affect the reprocessing of ophthalmic instrumentation. It's now time for you to align your processes with the instructions for use. It's also time to assess your sterilization process. Is it better for you to find and fix the misunderstanding? It is better for you to find and fix the misunderstanding of IUSS before a surveyor does. Lastly, reach out to your infection preventionist. You want to work with them to identify and correct cleaning, rinsing, and sterilization conditions that could create an opportunity of tasks in your patient population. And that concludes what I have for you. Here are a few of our references. And I will take questions.
Wonderful, Angela. We do have quite a few questions that have come in from the attendees. So uh, let's work through as many as we can until we hit our 60 minute mark today. Our first question is, we have a reusable brush policy. Should we switch to a single use brush for ophthalmic in instruments? So adopting single use brushes for ophthalmic instruments could significantly enhance infection control measures by eliminating the risk of cross-contamination that can occur with reusable brushes. Each instrument would be cleaned with a new brush, thereby reducing the possibility of transmitting any residual biological material or cleaning agents between uses. So this practice can be particularly advantageous in the context of ophthalmology, where instruments come into close contact with sensitive areas and the potential for post-operative complications like TAS must be minimized. In addition to cleaning brushes, it's important to consider all the components of instrument decontamination process. Dispensing fresh cleaning chemistry each time is equally important. Um, it ensures that the effectiveness of the decontamination process is not compromised by previously contaminated solutions and minimizes the risk of tasks and other post-operative complications. Amazing. I appreciate that information so much. Uh, another attendee has asked, how do we effectively train staff responsible for reprocessing eye instruments? Great question. Uh, effective training should include both theoretical and practical components, which covers the entire process from pre-cleaning to sterilization. Regular in-service training sessions, workshops, hands-on demonstrations can all be useful. Uh, competency assessments should be ongoing, involving direct observations, written tests, and performance evaluations to ensure that staff understand and can apply best practice in instrument reprocessing. I had a couple of attendees ask if you could go back to the reference slide just so they could capture that information. Uh, and while attendees are uh, digesting this, I'll ask the next question. Are there specific types of instruments more prone to causing TASS tests? Instruments with narrow lumens or complex designs are more prone to inadequate cleaning, which can retain debris or chemicals and lead to tasks. Uh, such instruments require meticulous cleaning with specialized brushes or tools and should be flushed thoroughly to ensure that all residues are removed. Enhanced inspection and testing of these instruments might also be necessary to ensure that they're clean. All right, we're going to keep with that theme. I, I had another attendee ask, in the event of a suspected TAS outbreak, what immediate action should be taken in relation to reprocessed instruments? Sure. If a TAS outbreak is suspected, immediate actions include halting the use of all suspect instruments, reviewing and documenting the reprocessing steps for those instruments, and conducting a thorough investigation of the entire surgical environment and the processes. Samples from the instruments and surgical solutions should be taken for analysis to identify the source of the contamination. Communicating with all relevant personnel and possibly notifying patients who may be at risk are also critical steps. All right, and another attendee has asked, um, are there special considerations for eye instrument containers? Yes, there are special considerations for ophthalmic instrument containers to minimize the risk of TAS. It's critical to use containers that are compatible with your chosen sterilization method and to follow manufacturer's instructions regarding the packing and loading. Additionally, all of the considerations that apply to eye instruments also apply to the containers themselves, so they should be inspected, cleaned using the appropriate cleaning chemistries, and maintained to prevent harmful residues that could lead to TAS. I have an attendee that wants to follow up on something discussed in the presentation. Could you briefly explain the two rinse cycles for the ultrasonic washer again? Sure. Um, there are certain manufacturers, and I don't have those in front of me, um, that do require two separate um, cycles. So in the first, it was a static bath, I believe, and um, the, the cycle, the standard cycle, and then the second one would be for the, um, for the critical water rinse. So it's important to review those IFUs. They'll tell you um, what the validated process for that particular instrument is. 
Wonderful. Uh, another attendee is asking, what is the typical dry time on a short cycle? That's a great question. Uh, it's going to depend on your instruments, really, um, and in the tests that you've performed. So depending on where those IFUs start and how your, um, how your loads look, whether you have heavy or mixed loads um, or mixed materials inside those I loads, it's going to vary. So um, it's important that you perform your own test. All right, I'm gonna ask one more question. Uh, can pretreatment Blue 62 be used by surgery for pretreatment before sending down to SPD? So I won't speak specifically to Blue 62 because um, I don't handle that product, but pretreatment products, um, it varies what materials they are, or what chemicals rather they're made of. So oftentimes ophthalmic instrumentation cannot have enzymatics. Um, and that'll be specified in those instructions for use. So based on the instructions for use for the instrument and also the materials that are uh, make up that pretreatment product is going to determine whether or not it can be used for that particular instrument. Wonderful, Angela. I know I said that was the last question. I had one more that pinged in quickly. Uh, this individual is curious if there is best practices for disinfecting decon sinks to accept eye instruments. Oh, good question. Um, offhand, I don't have in front of me what um, chemicals might be best, although uh, it probably will depend in part on the uh, operator's manual for your sink, what they recommend. Um, the AORN guidelines for perioperative practice mention sinks and how to handle those, so that might be a place to look. Um, the 2024 edition I know has a few sections that might be relevant to that. Perfect. But best practice would be to make sure that it's wiped out between each case um, and definitely between eye instruments and other procedure instruments. Wonderful. There are a few additional questions, but in the interest of everyone's time today, I'll send those to you offline so you can follow up with these attendees at your convenience. And I want to express a big thank you and, of course, gratitude to you and Steris for the webinar today. I appreciate the time and the information that you've shared with us. Uh, please visit Steris' website, keysurgical.com, to learn more about the products they provide for the industry. As promised, today's trivia question answer is dark blue. So congratulations to our winner, Tracy Sheets. You'll be receiving that OR Today lunch bag in the mail very soon. And a quick reminder before I let everyone go, uh, to obtain your CE certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed right now, one hour from right now. Uh, you must complete the survey to obtain your certificate, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once that survey is submitted. There will also be additional details for the added accreditation that you might be seeking. If you have any issues or questions about the certificate process, do give us an email at webinar at mdpublishing.com. I wanna encourage everyone to visit ortodaywebinars.live for more details on our upcoming webinars. And of course, everything has complimentary registration. Quick reminder, that if you've missed any of our past OR Today webinars, you're still able to view them on our website. Again, that address is ortodaywebinars.live. Thank you for your time today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and we will see you back here for another webinar very soon. Thank you, Jamie.